You know what will help me is uh, to understand the audience. I'm going to ask three questions. You know, brand new to DevOps, kind of learning DevOps, and practicing DevOps. So how many people are in that first category? Just sort of like, what is this thing DevOps? Okay, great. And then how many people are like, yeah, you know, f toes in the water, trying it out. And then how many people are like black belts doing DevOps? Oh, okay, great, great mix. Okay, well, so today I'm going to talk about the DevOpsification of Windows Server. Um, I'm Jeffrey Snover. I'm a Microsoft Technical Fellow. That's kind of a big deal. Um, there are... <laughs> Well, it's an interesting story. So the question is, why is, it, why is that guy did a command line interface, a technical fellow? Because we've got over 100,000 employees, and we have, I think, um, 22 technical fellows, of which most of them are 24 technical fellows, of which most of them are really vice presidents, people with 700 people working for them, that sort of thing. There's only 11 individual contributor technical fellows, of which four are in research, so there are only seven guys like me. And the question is, again, why did a guy who invented a command line interface become a technical fellow? Hopefully, at the end of the talk, you will see why, okay? turns out it's kind of important. Anyway, I'm the chief architect for the Enterprise Cloud Group. That's stuff that brings you the wonderful Windows Server, uh, Windows Server uh, Azure Stack, the ability to run Azure on your data centers, on your servers, uh, System Center, and Operations Management Suite. So, what is DevOps? I go to a lot of conferences where this is the topic. Rarely do I see people walk away from that conversation saying, well, that's settled. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of interesting conversations around what is DevOps, but there seems to be a consensus that DevOps is really about culture and processes. And there's also a consensus that DevOps is not about tools and technology, right? It's not something you go to a catalog and say, I'll buy myself some DevOps and I'll throw some money at this problem, and the problem goes away, yay. It is not that at all. There is uniform consensus on this point. But, you know, this is wrong as well. And why is it wrong? And the answer is that tools and technology do play a critical role. They are not the critical role, but they do play a critical role. And in particular, there are certain tools and technologies that make DevOps hard, and there are tools and technologies that make DevOps easy. Okay, so tools and technologies do play an important role. In fact, a critical role. And what I'm here to tell you is that Windows Server 2016 is architected to make DevOps easier, right? You're doing DevOps with Windows. Everybody find that just like the easiest thing in the world? I didn't see any hands. Okay, right. There's challenges. The reality is there's challenges in any operating system that you use. But in particular, some of the ways we did things in Windows because of, and I'll talk about our history, they were fantastic for a certain style of computing, and then as you change the style of computing, uh, its strengths become weaknesses. And so now you need to compensate for that and do things differently. And in Windows Server 2016, luckily I was the chief architect, and so I got to make a call on that. So Windows Server 2016 resolves the interface between developers and operators. You see, in the past, right, we we're sort of like this hippie thing, you know, we're a great operating system, we provide APIs, but then it's sort of up to you to decide, hey, how should developers and operators do things? You know, we let a thousand blossoms bloom. There really was no architecture for a number of key interfaces between developers and operators. But whereas a thousand blossoms bloomed, so too did a thousand conflicts. And we really set up the industry for a set of conflicts between developers and operators that in a lot of cases was not a constructive thing to do. So Windows Server 2016, what I'm doing is I'm resolving those interfaces between developers and operators. Now, there are two models for this. First, the traditional model. The model almost everyone in this room understands intrinsically, even if I asked you what it was, you might not be able to say it. When you saw it, you'd say, yeah, that's, that's what we do. And uh, so we're working on that. But there is this new model, and the new model is a model, an operations model based upon containers. Containers are a very important technology. The reality is 
As an industry, we don't really know how we're gonna end up using containers, but we know they're important and we know we're gonna use them. But here's what is clear. What is clear is that it shifts who does what and when. So many of the things that you do in a traditional operations model, you're going to do, but instead of the operator doing it on instances, the developer is going to do them uh, to produce a container that then gets handed off to an operator. So the point, key point I want to make here is we are resolving the interface between developers and operators, both for the traditional way of doing operations and for this new emerging way of doing operations. So I always like to start with the why, right? If, you heard, if you've seen me talk before, you know my favorite joke in the world is the joke about the, the two guys in the forest, right? Where they see this bear, it's gonna come eat them, and they're gonna make a run for it. And the one guy stops, takes off his backpack, and pulls out a pair of running shoes. And his buddy says, Tom, the American grizzly bear can run 35 miles an hour. There's no way you can outrun a grizzly bear even with those running shoes. And he said, well, Bob, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. Now, right now, the point of that joke, the point of that joke is that sometimes when you see people, their actions can seem bizarre and you can't comprehend them until you understand their motivations. Okay, so we're doing a bunch of things that, that seem, are sort of not intuitive, right? Why is Microsoft doing that? What's going on there? And until you understand the motivations, uh, sometimes these things can be hard to understand and they can cause confusion. So I'm gonna start here with the evolution of Windows Server. Windows Server has gone through various eras and we're about to start a new era. And these errors are fundamental ways of doing things. There's ways to do things, um, et cetera. So now, the first era was server for the masses. Boy, you all remember this, right? You took this awesome Dave Cutler kernel, put a desktop experience on it, ran it on PC economics hardware. Holy schmoly, did we change the world with this operating system. Prior to this, you know, uh, servers were the domain of the priesthood, right? The special priest, you had to supplicate before them, you know, had to kill a chicken, offer them things, and, and then you never got what you wanted. With Windows, for the, for Windows Server for the masses, now anyone could buy, deploy, and operate their own servers. It was a revolution. By the way, what that also meant was the skill level for administrators dramatically decreased, right? Just click, click, click. Well, if you could click the next button, you could have a server. Incredibly useful. Now, this was so successful, and the client was so incredibly successful, it caused a crisis, and that crisis was resolved by the second era of Windows Server. Starting Windows 2000, we added Active Directory and Group Policy, and now all of a sudden, People could take these individual units and tie them together as an enterprise and have them work together, right? Revolutionary operating system. We added in 2003 uh, .NET, and that created the line of business application explosion, right? Where now we democratized business applications. Whereas before you had to purchase one or you had to go to IBM and pay them incredible amounts of money and maybe it worked and maybe it didn't. Now all of a sudden with .NET, so many people were able to write production quality, mission critical applications of their own and deploy them on Windows Server. That then brought about this next crisis. There were so many of those that we had to bring about the era of the data center server, right? And the data center server, 2008, 2008 or two, 2012, we had to allow scale up applications, right? Run some of the largest uh, workloads in the world. We had scale out. We had virtualization in Hyper-V. We improved our networking and storage stacks. And we got good at automation, okay? So this was the technology that was allowed Azure to be born. And using these technologies, Azure now created the cloud era and in Windows Server 2016, we're bringing those lessons to the world um, with Windows Server 2016, right? So this is now the fourth era of, the, of server, the cloud servers. Now, the interesting thing about this is that each one of these eras has been additive, okay? Not replacing, okay? So, and in each era, there's a way of doing things, okay? Um, so, 
Windows Server 2016 is a great server for the masses. If you are still one of those people that want to buy a box that you put on your desk, you give it a big hug in the morning, you plug a keyboard, a mouse, a touchscreen monitor to it, with Windows Server 2016, you're going to be able to say, hey, Cortana, start IIS. Or as one person joked, they said, now swearing at your computer will be a two-way conversation. Okay, so, so indeed, Windows Server 2016, great server for the masses. It's a great enterprise server. It's a great data center server. But really, our focus is on enabling this new model, cloud servers. Okay, and again, you do things differently. There's been a lot of people out there who have great consternation about how one of the deployment uh, scenarios for cloud servers is something called nano server. And in nano server, we do not have group policy. Group policy was very important here and here. Well, actually, it sort of broke down here in reality, but it was very important here. <laughs> well, no, it was. I had some guy run at a data center, and they, they buy, he buys me coffee, and he almost punched me in the nose, like, hey, dude, you know, how do you solve this problem? I said, well, group policy. I said, are you clueless? Let me tell you the problems of using group policy in a data center. Uh, and so, indeed, didn't really work there, and it definitely doesn't work for cloud servers. Just the semantics of it, right? The concept, yes. The semantics, no. So you have a different way of doing it in cloud servers. But we'll talk a bit more about that. So, it's all about being cloud competitive, right? What does it take to be cloud competitive? And the answer is, you have to be small and fast, right? You gotta be able to minimize the attack surface, right? This is about a no drama world. You don't want any drama in the cloud, right? You wanna do your business, you wanna do your business well, and you don't want any drama. Hackers, hackers are drama. You wanna be able to minimize your patches and your reboots. Again, drama, don't wanna have any drama. And you wanna be optimized for DevOps, okay? So these are the things, the why, that motivated our planning and my architecture behind Windows Server 2016. So, why? You know, why do we focus in on this? And the answer is that the cloud and DevOps model is really about the shift, a shift in IT. A shift in IT, look, it's always been this case, but the reality is the majority of IT is about sort of saving money, a saving money mindset. And when the cloud and DevOps shifts that mindset and says, hey, we can use IT to make money. In fact, if we do it right, we can make lots of money. I recently had a, an interview with a, a reporter who was asking me, hey, this nano server thing, turns out you gotta change your code to take advantage of nano server. How many people are gonna convert their applications to run nano server? And I said, well, you know, I think you're thinking about this all wrong. He said, what do you mean? He says, well, indeed, there are some people who have written a Windows 2003 application who might take a look at the benefits offered by Windows Server 2016 and Nano Server and decide to finally get off 2003, uh, refactor that code, and uh, target Nano Server. Definitely. How many? I have no idea. But that's not the story. The real story is this. The real story is that when you figure out cloud, and you figure out DevOps, and you figure out these new application models, and the reduced friction of the cloud, and the credible operational characteristics and elasticity that you get in the cloud, what it means is that the vast, vast majority of computing is ahead of us, not behind us. Because when you can connect the dots between your operations and your code and making money, guess what? No longer do you have this conversation about, hey, can, can you save us some more money? Like, I need to, get, to have you take a 10% cut next year. Instead, it's like, well, wait, so if I threw some more money at you, then what could you do? That's a much better conversation, let me tell you. Okay? So that's what this is about. We believe that if we get it right, we can start making money versus not. Now, again, some people have always been doing this, but as an industry, as an industry, we're starting to get very good at figuring out how to tr translate IT into money. So, when I talk about the DevOpsification of Windows Server, here's the categories I'm talking about. Oh, that's a bad color. <laughs> so that says componentization, nano server and PowerShell core, uh, deployment, packaging deployment, um, sorry, development, pack packaging and deployment, configuration, containers and Docker, 
uh, operational validation testing, and operating securely. So we'll drill into each one of these. So componentization. Windows Server 2016 allows three deployment options. The first is the traditional one, right? Server and a desktop, right? Because see what I did there? SAD, server and a desktop, it makes me sad. Okay. So anyway, so for those people who are still deploying a server and a desktop, indeed, you get, you know, uh, like to say, so, you know, as an inventor of PowerShell, I did all these, you know, consulting engineer at Digital, principal engineer at Tivoli, you know, technical fellow at Microsoft, and I was the lead architect of the world's first touch-enabled server. Uh, and now I'm the lead architect of the world's first Cortana-enabled server. Uh, I'm proud of many of these accomplishments. <laughs> so, but, not, but not all of them. Anyway, so indeed, this is, this is great. You can Cortana enable your server. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and if it is good for if you're still in that single desktop environment. You know, you, sorry, it's good for two scenarios. One is RDS. Yeah, that's the whole point, uh, remote desktop services, or you have a single server and you want to interact with it that way. So it's still available there. Next, we have server core. Server core is more for your data center scenarios, your traditional virtual machine uh, workloads, uh, offers significantly lower maintenance and uh, environments. But we have this new environment, and this new environment is called Nano Server. Uh, Nano Server is a just enough operating system model. Just enough operating system model basically says I start off with a very small core that can do some things, but then you bring in the components that you want when you want them. Okay, and then you only incur the security, reliability, um, uh, patching and, and uh, resource consumption of the components that you're actually using. Look, if you're you writing an application and you're using some component, the fact that that component needs to take a security patch and therefore you have to reboot the server, that's the deal, and that makes sense. But what just seems sort of unjust, like immoral, is you're having to patch your servers and affect your customers because there's some component which you didn't want and, and, and it's on your system and you don't use but it still has to take a patch. And guess what? You do have to patch it. If it's on the system, you got to patch it. And then you have to affect your server. So I don't know about you, that just seemed immoral to me. So I decided to fix it. So that's the benefit of being the chief architect. You get to fix these things. Uh, anyway, so now this is, let me be clear. Nano server is the future of Windows Server. Full stop. You all want to get really good at Nano server. Okay, now nano server version one does not do everything. Okay, we're focused in on two scenarios. So depending upon what you're doing, you need to get familiar with nano server right away, or it's gotta be on your radar screen knowing eventually you'll need to get very good at it. The two scenarios that we have today are one, well actually, are, <laughs> turns out, 56 slides, I cut some. Okay, <laughs> two scenarios are number one, um, cloud OS infrastructure. This is the code I'm gonna run on the physical machines to run our clouds. <clears throat> okay, so this is things like Azure Stack and our virtualization stack. So these are clustered hypervisor and clustered storage and some networking things. Next is born in the cloud applications. You're gonna write applications targeting this. And so this is things like ASP.NET and IIS and all that good stuff. Okay, now Nano Server is optimized for a cloud era. Being optimized for a cloud era means you do things differently. It's not exactly the way things were in the past because if you did those things, you'd already be optimized for the cloud and we're not. Now, have you ever noticed that when you go to a Windows Server machine and you say, hey, I'd like to install IIS, it does not say, please insert the disk, right? Why is that? And the answer is, because when you installed it, we put everything on the disk. So when you ask yourself, geez, why are these Windows VHDs so large? One of the major reasons is absolutely everything is there already. And so when you say I want to install it, it really is all about, hey, take it from this hidden directory and put it in this non-hidden directory, okay? 
not optimized for the cloud. Like, works fine when you got this one machine, you know, Bob and his machine, and he's in his dentist office all by himself, and he wants to install IIS. You don't want him trying to find a disk, right? So it works perfectly there. But when you say, hey, I'm a cloud, I'm going to have 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 images, copying all that stuff around for 10,000 images ain't going to work. So we have this zero footprint model. <clears throat> all the roles and features operate outside, it live outside of Nano Server, and then you install them. Right? So you install packages like you install uh, applications. And in fact, there's a package manager in Windows Server, and these packages, I don't know if you've done this, this is like my favorite thing of this latest TP, is you put Nano Server on there, and if you want to, you can install the services then, or you can go and download the uh, packages from the web. It's crazy, so it's really cool. Anyway, so then we, um, these are the key roles and features I mentioned to you. Uh, clustered hypervisor, clustered storage, DNS server, and then that's for physical hosts, cloud OS infrastructure. We'll have IIS.NET Core, ASP.NET Core, oh, and Service Fabric. It's not there yet, but that's coming, Service Fabric for applications. Has full, but now, just to be clear, it is Windows. It's it's Windows, so you have full driver support. Now, if your driver provider uh, provides their driver with a GUI installer, give the, reach out and give those guys a whack. Say, hey, welcome to, you know, the 1980s called, they want their installer back. This is a, it's not how you do an installer these days. No GUI, my friend. Uh, any malware is now integrated into the operating system, and that is available. That's the Defender package, and that's available on Nano Server. And then the System Center, VMM, and OM agents are available as well. Now, because this is such a small environment, we don't have full .NET. We have .NET Core. .NET is effectively doing the same thing I'm doing, which is to say, a just enough runtime uh, operating system just enough runtime environment, where they start off something small, and then you bring in just the components that you want. We call this .NET Core. Now, PowerShell being a full .NET application, it needed to be refactored to work on .NET Core. So we have PowerShell Core. Uh, it's refactored to run on .NET Core. It has the full PowerShell language uh, and remoting, okay? Uh, so you get invoke command, you know, new PS session, uh, et cetera. And it has most of the core engine components. The one big thing that it does not have is a workflow. And we have plans for that, just a, a, just a timing issue. Uh, but you'll be able to support all the existing commandlet types except for workflow. So you can use C-sharp commands, you can use uh, native commands with WMI, you can use PowerShell script commands, those all work. And we have a limited but very rapidly growing set of commands. When we started, the first drop had like 85 commands. That was a bad day. And then within about two weeks, we had 185. And then when I last checked and when you installed everything, there was, uh, it was well over 1,000. I think there was 1,200 and some odd. Now, the, the total number will be a function of the components that get refactored to run on it. If you don't refactor the component, it doesn't make sense to refactor the commandlets. But this is going very, very well. So that was componentization. So now let's talk about deployment, okay? This is nano server, or sorry, development. Nano server in the SDK. Now, as crazy as this sounds, as crazy as this sounds, did you realize that Windows Server does not and has never had an SDK? How crazy is that? And so the model has been, well, there's a Windows SDK, and uh, don't call these APIs. Well, in fact, because server in a desktop, actually, you could call any of those APIs. You know, you can call, uh, you know, write a fart application and have it run on your server if you want. You know, that, that'll work. You got sound APIs. You put a sound card in a, in a server. Anyway, so we've never had a server application. Well, now we do. Okay, this server, sorry, the server SDK. The server SDK is focused in on Nano Server. You'll go into Visual Studio and you'll say, hey, you download the SDK, go into Visual Studio and say, I'd like to target a Nano Server application. It will show you the APIs that are available and give you squiggle lines when you bring in code that call APIs that are not. Now, what APIs aren't going to be available? Any guesses? Any guesses? GUI. GUI, yeah, right. <laughs> GUI applications, right? There are no GUI APIs, okay? Because why would you need a GUI on a server? And why would you need a GUI on a cloud server? Now, it turns out that there's a set of APIs that you don't realize use the GUI stack, but they do. 
And so we have, like, because they use the message pump underneath there for its communications, and so we have alternate versions for those. So we'll see those things and we'll say, hey, don't use that API, use this API. So there's, in general, uh, equivalence for those. So you have that. Uh, we've got a rich projecting, IntelliSense. You get error squiggles when you do things that are not going to work for nano server. And of course, you have a full debugging environment. So now Windows Server finally has an SDK. Yay. Now, now we're going to talk about packaging and deployment. Okay, so this is about WSA, Windows Server Installer, and package management, what we used to call OneGet. But before I get to those, I first want to have a talk about MSI, right? In the darkness, that is hell. Okay, so MSI. MSI has never been part of the operating system. It's just a random XE that you can run, right? And then does stuff. And what does it do? All sorts of evil stuff. Now, now indeed, at, at some point they tried to be declarative, but then, you know, not having the courage of their convictions, they added this little thing, a little thing called custom actions. And my friends, custom actions are the portal to hell. Uh, because they mean that you cannot reason against the system, you have no idea what really happened, you have no ability to do <coughs> offline processing, you have no ability to undo the installation to remove it and know that it's cleanly done. So MSI, evil, gone. And it also turns out MSI has a lot of GUI dependencies. So MSI is not supported on nano server, it will not be supported on nano server. Not touching this junk. <laughs> and why would you? We have a new model. It's called WSA, Windows Server Installer. This is a purely declarative installer. Uh, it is based upon the uh, Windows client AppX technology. AppX technology, really great, focused in on the client. It does two things. It's a declarative, they've coupled a declarative installer and an isolation model. We do not pick up the isolation model. That's not for servers. Uh, but we do pick up the installation model, and then we extend it for server scenarios. Things like um, uh, services, perf counters, registration of com objects, WMI providers, ETW events, etc. No custom actions, yes. And this has been very successful. Turns out four out of five kittens just love WSA. You're, if you're in part of the cloud era, you've got to realize that kittens are the foundation of the cloud. So... Um, now, for people that need to support nano server and down-level systems, we're working with the partner community, Fire, I, Fire Giant, uh, guys who, write, who do Wix. Uh, you can write a Wix installer and then have it render into a WSA or an MSI. Okay, so the partner communities will, will help you with that. Package management. Package management. Uh, here's sort of the experience of package management, right? You'd be able to say, find me packages, install a package, save a package. It downloads it but doesn't install it. Get gives you an inventory, and then you can uninstall things. So pretty simple model, right? So why are we talking about it? And the answer is, well, one, it never existed. And two, here are, what do you operate against? And the answer is package management providers, okay? Now look at the various package providers. NuGet, oh, so you can run this and get all your source code, uh, all your code for developers, yes. Well, NuGet has an, a way of doing that already. Yep, they do, and this is another way. So there's two ways to do it. Oh, look, container provider, what's that? Well, in containers, you gotta get your images. So how are you gonna get it? Oh, you're gonna use this, oh, that's good. GitHub, oh wait, so I can get stuff from Git? I can get stuff from TSD? I can get nano server packages, these are the optional components. I can get GIST, I can get container images, Office, GitLab, WSA. And the answer is that our package management is really a package management management system. That there are lots of different package management, there's lots of different software, uh, communities of software out there, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide you a coherent experience of all those communities. So here's the way this works, right? Starting from here, going there. There's lots of different package sources, okay? Now part of this is types, and part of this are locations, okay? So for instance, let's take here the PowerShell gallery. So PowerShell gallery, I can bring stuff down from the PowerShell gallery. That's a particular type of software. But it's also location. You might say, hey, I'm, my company, 
wants to monitor things very strictly, and I don't want to just be able to pull things down from the PowerShell gallery. What you can do is you can set up your own local PowerShell gallery and pull things from it. You put only things that you vetted and trust in it and then download from it. So then, so you have these, oh, you got these sources, you have these sources, you have the providers that know how to take these things and project it into a uniform experience, and then you have the uniform experience. So that's what package management is all about. Desired state configuration, boy, there's just so much to talk about here, and hopefully we're going to talk about it through the day. I just wanted to zoom through this. This is the declarative way of saying things. I want the world to be like this, right? The Jean-Luc Picard world of the way of the world. You know, here it is, make it so. And somebody else goes and does all the hard work for you. Uh, and desired state configuration is our platform. Uh, it is a platform technology. We enable third parties like Chef, Puppet, et cetera, but then we also have our own solutions with operations management uh, suite. This is a heterogeneous platform, so it works both on down-level windows and on Linux. Pretty cool stuff. And again, third solutions. So here's a couple links to where you can find more information on it. Again, it's such a large topic, uh, I could just go down that rat hole. Now, when it comes to containers and dockers, and what you're going to do is you're going to figure out what uh, environment, what set of APIs and what set of services you want to target, be it you know ser the SAD environment, server core, or nano server, and then you're going to decide how I'm going to run it, what mode. Now, all, you can run all of those on either physical hosts or virtual machines, but you can for containers, you have two options, Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers, and you can only run Nano Server and Server Core in containers. If SAD, SAD applications, don't get containers. Not going there. Now, the difference between these two is, is uh, isolation and security. So Windows Server containers, that's exactly isomorphic to the Linux containers and uh, is very good for sort of friendly enterprise-grade multi-tenancy. Like, you might be in a different uh, department. We work for the same company. You're in a different department. You're trying to steal my budget, but you're really not trying to destroy me, I hope, right? Whereas hostile multi-tenancy, you know, you're, you're from the KGB and you're from the CIA and you're both putting your workloads on the same machine. You know, there's some hostility there. Well, Hyper-V containers gives you the the security of Hyper-V isolation. Uh, and so that's a very, uh, they're more f suitable for hostile multi-tenancy. So whether it's Hyper-V or Windows Server containers, you can run any of the application f uh, uh, frameworks, that's our goal, and have a consistent management interface. And that management interface is Docker. Docker is not containers. Docker is a management API to containers that works against local containers or remote containers. And so now what you'll be able to do is Docker will be able to work against local or remote Linux or Windows. And so all the applications that run on top of Docker will work against Windows. Very cool stuff. When it comes to operational validation testing, so the thing about operational validation testing, some people get this confused. They say, well, geez, if I have desired state configuration, why would I need operational validation testing? Because in fact, um, well, and, and here is the answer, an illustration of the answer, okay? Notice these things are, I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> these are configured properly and completely uh, uh, dysfunctional, right? Another example is imagine a perfectly configured set of machines uh, where you forgot to plug in the ethernet wires, right? And you go and you say, oh, well, they're configured properly, but they don't actually operate. So what we want to do is we want to be able to configure things so that they can operate well, okay? So this is an example of what that looks like. Um, this is a pester test. We build this based upon pester. Uh, pester is our unit test framework for code. And uh, basically you say, you describe things. The SQL server should be running. And you say invoke command, get server this, and you say the status should be running. The SQL server, SQL Server agent should be running, should be listening on this port, should be able to query. So you write this thing, and it's pretty straightforward to read and like, oh, I see what I'm going to do. But then when you go and you run it, 
Here's the beauty, right? You say invoke operational validation. You give it one of these tests. And it comes back and says, I can't actually read it, but it comes back and says, oh, the SQL server's running. You know, it should be this. And everything's fine. If any of these had failed, it says it, it failed and why it failed. So the point is, how many of you, here's the, here's the $64,000 question. Patch Tuesday. You went and patched all your servers. When do you get to go home? When do you get to go home? Who knows, right? Who knows, right? The answer is, most people, the answer is as quickly as possible. You know? <laughs> Hopefully, uh, uh, the second shift get, will handle any problem. Or what they say is, we monitor the telephone. You know, we monitor the telephone, and nothing happens. I guess we go home. Well, that's kind of a crappy world, right? It's a crappy world. And, and, and certainly not a way you want to be running your business, right? You want to know if you've made a change, did that change screw things up or not? And so the idea here is that you build a large and growing suite of these operational validation tests. And then when, the, when you make a change, whether it's a patch to a system, a change to the application, an introduction of a new, a new component, or a new rollout of a continuous deployment uh, system, you will run these operational validation tests. And they're going to tell you whether things are still running or not. And if they are, you know, there might be a problem out there, but at least you know a couple thousand things are working. And if something is broken, you're going to know pretty quickly what's broken, and you're going to know very precisely what's broken. So this really just transforms the experience of, of the environment. Now, by the way, so operational validation testing, turns out it's this very small piece of code, it's about 500 lines of code, that layered on top of Pester, that really just make it easy for you to write them, and you to write them, and you to write them, and to share them, so that we as a community can share these things, uh, and then work together to produce operational validation tests for everything, right? Now, obviously, you're going to write the ones specific to your application, and you won't share those, but uh, we've already seen some really good ones around Active Directory, around SQL, uh, and boy, who wants to rewrite all that stuff, right? Just publish that stuff up to the gallery, pull it down, somebody did it, hey, they missed something, go add that check, push it back up to the gallery, make the, you know, get better through the community. Last thing is operational validation testing, or sorry, oper operating securely with Jia. So here's the system. Here's the problem, right? You have this guy, Michael Hayden, you know, four-star general, director of the CIA, director of the NSA, director of national intelligence, and there's this guy, Edward Snowden, 30-year college dropout. Hayden once made a decision that I'm sure he will go to as a grave regretting. That is, he made this guy an admin of his system. And uh, that was game over, right? <laughs> game over. And why is that? And the answer is that the admins can do anything, right? And in fact, the documents that Snowden released, one of them was called I Hunt and Hack System Admins. Now, let's make this really clear. This is not theoretical, right? The, the government agencies are hacking you. I mean, not... not not you like, I mean you as individuals. They are after you, seriously. And why are they after you? And the answer is because you have the keys to the kingdom, right? They could hack those systems, but boy, that's really hard. It's easier to hack you. And once they hack you, they have your privileges, you have the keys to the kingdom, so then they can do anything with your credentials, okay? So, and I mean that quite seriously. Just read the documents Snowden said. They're very clear about this. I'm going after you. So, Imagine this what is what GIA is all about. GIA is about um, being able to say, I'm going to allow servers, people to be able to do administrative actions uh, where, the, where uh, the user does not have to be an admin. So imagine you have a system here with all these capabilities, right? And the, of those capabilities, these are the set of capabilities that can be safely done by a role, and these are the dangerous ones. Okay, what GIA does is it allows you to define this interface and then give these functions to a group of people without making them admin, without making them admin. So what you do is you define these roles and you define the people who can access those roles, those, those operations, and when they come in, we dynamically create an account with admin privileges running on their behalf they do the operations, and then when we're done, we throw that account away. 
Now, let me be real crisp about this. Imagine the Snowden case. What was the Snowden case? The Snowden case was he was a SharePoint admin. SharePoint admins need to be able to, oh, SharePoint admins, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. SharePoint admins need to be able to create SharePoint systems. They need to be able to back them up. They might even need to, to delete them. But because you're a SharePoint admin, you can also read all the contents of the SharePoint site. Like, does that make any sense? No. Anyway, GIA allows you to define safe and unsafe operations. And had Snowden been able to perform SharePoint administrative functions but not be able to read things, we'd be having a very different conversation and we wouldn't be having this conversation and I wouldn't have invented GIA and we'd be all less safe. So, so there's that too. <laughs> anyway, so here's the way this model works. You got this young uh, admin here, uh, Edward, he wants to go to the HR server. He's able to connect via GIA uh, to an endpoint where he's able to perform an operation, restart the SQL service, happy days. But then when he tries to perform the steel secrets operation, uh, he is given a, this nicely formed error message. You're not allowed to steal secrets. Okay. Uh, so that's what GIA is all about, operating securely. So again, what I said was that when I talk about the DevOpsification, what I'm talking about is these areas. Componentization, development, packaging and deployment, configuration, container and Docker, operational validation, and operating securely. There will be more, but these are the cornerstone features. Okay? Windows Server 2016 finally resolves these interfaces between the developers and the operators. Okay? But having done it for Windows Server 2016, we've taken as many of these components as possible and made them available down level. So the things in white, the componentization, I can't go back and recomponentize Windows Server 2008. That ship has sailed. Same thing with the development. I'm not going to do uh, an SDK for down level operating systems. We got it for this. But and containers of packaging, Docker, same thing. But for the packaging and deployment, configuration, operational validation, testing, and the GIA, we are making those available down level. So even if you are not adopting Windows Server 2016 today, you need to lean in and learn these technologies, and they will make you a better operator, more valuable, and better prepared to move to the cloud. I mentioned to you that this is all about being cloud competitive, right? It being cloud competitive, we need to be small and fast. We need to minimize our attack surface. We need to minimize our patching and reboots, and we need to optimize for DevOps. So again, I to wanted to explain the why we're doing what we're doing, the why behind the what. So let's see how we did. Here are the servicing improvements. Now, what we did was we took a look at the patches in 2014, and we saw the code that was required to make that patch, and then we went and said, hey, if we had had Windows Nano Server, would we have had to take the patch? In terms of important bulletins, there were 26, 23, 26 for full server, 23 for server core. There were only nine for Nano Server. In terms of critical patches, the ones that really matter, you go from 23 down to two. Now let me let that sink in here a second. Had you, been, had, you had Nano Server, you would have had one-tenth the number of critical patches. One-tenth. Okay. Now here's the other thing to sink in. These patches, guess what? Before they were a patch, they were a security vulnerability. Like until you patch that system, like the bad guys could get in. We just didn't know about that. Okay, so what that really says is not only is it one-tenth the number of patches, but it's ten times more secure. That math isn't quite right, but there were at least ten times as many vulnerabilities that that system did not have. It was intrinsically more secure, okay? And when it, then this translates to reboots, there's a nonlinear uh, uh, mapping because of clustering, but we went from 11 reboots down to three, so a little more than 25% of the reboots, okay? So pretty pretty significant advance. When it comes to security improvements, we reduced the number of drivers loaded from 98 to 73. Services running, almost half, 44 to 25. And the ports open, less than half, 26 down to 11. Okay, so much more secure. And by the way, those were all against, against server core. 
When it comes to resource utilization, process count goes down by about 20%, 26 to 21. The number of IOs, we're measuring the number of IOs required to boot a system. Go from 306 down to 108, right? Why is that important? In the cloud, you're starting up a whole bunch of stuff. In a world of immutable infrastructure, you're starting a bunch of stuff. You want to minimize the resources to get stuff up and running. And once you're running, the kernel memory in use, check this out, it's less than half, from about 140 down to about 60, right? So what's that mean? That's about VM density. So if you're a hoster and you want to make a lot of money, with this, you can host more VMs on the same physical hardware. It's a good deal. Now, deployment. Deployments. You ready for this one? The setup time for server core goes from 300 for nano server, it goes down to 40 seconds. 300 seconds to 40 seconds. In terms of disk footprint, we go from 5.4 gigabytes to 0.4, and from a VHD size. VHD size, server and a desktop, the SAD deployment, is about 10 gigabytes. Server core, it's about 600 gigabytes, six gigabytes. Nano server, 440 megabytes. 10 gigabytes. 440 megabytes. This thing is a speed demon. And when you start it on a Gen 2 VM, you know, with SSDs, it starts in about 2.5 seconds. I mean, it's just crazy. Just crazy. So, I mentioned to you, a lot of the conversation is around DevOps, right? DevOps. What is DevOps? And we talk about how, well, DevOps is really about culture and processes, and that is absolutely correct. You can have the best technology in the world, but if you do not fix your culture and your processes, uh, you will not achieve DevOps and you will not achieve the business objectives of DevOps. So you definitely want to focus in on these things, but recognize that in addition to that, tools and technology absolutely do play a critical role, right? If you try and do DevOps with Windows Server, you know, um, uh, NT, I submit you're not going to be so successful, right? No PowerShell. Hard to do DevOps without PowerShell, honestly. Um, Windows Server 2016, I've architected it so that it makes DevOps easier. And I'm very interested to see how we did. As you try this and you kick the tires, I'd love to know where it works and more importantly where it doesn't work uh, because we're not done with Windows Server 2016. More investments will be made. Now it's important to talk about this idea about the world changing. The world is changing, and it's changing in dramatic ways. And it's just a reality that in times of change, the job often outgrows good people, okay? So not everybody's gonna make it through this change. And what I encourage you to do is as you think about these various things, server for the masses, enterprise server, data center servers, and cloud servers, you have to figure out where you're going, right? Where you're going as a company, where you're going as an individual. And you got to figure out, are you aligned, right? Are you working at a company? Do you want to go to the cloud and you're not working for a company to go, that wants to go to the cloud? Or they say they do, but they actually don't? Don Jones has a wonderful phrase for this. He says, when you find yourself in that situation, change your company or change your company. Look, there's nothing immoral about a company saying, hey, our best days are behind us, not ahead of us. You know, we are really good here, and we're going to stay here. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to go here, if you see the illusion here, you know, the promise here, and you want to move here, and your company doesn't, that's an irreconcilable difference, right? So try and change it, and if you can't change it, decide. Are you just going to stay there, or do you need to change companies? So too, if you're a company, if you're a manager, and you're trying to bring your organization here, you might have a set of employees who said, hey, you know what? I got really good at my skill set back here or back here, and I, I'm done. You know, I've got a wife. i got kids. At the weekend, I want to spend time with my kids and stuff. I don't want to be learning this DevOps stuff. I don't want to be investing in my career. I, I just want to, like, do what I want to do. And those people exist, and that's great, and there are jobs that are here and here. But if you're trying to move your company here, that's probably the not, not the right employee for you. And maybe the, the job has outgrown that otherwise good person. Don't worry, there are places that aren't moving to the cloud. They'll, they'll find a role. But what you want to do is, whether it's your company, your employees, or your vendors, 
What you want to recognize is that not everybody is going to be moving forward. They are of an era, and you need to decide uh, what you want to do and then align yourself with the people who are of the era you want to be, right? If you want to stay here, but you got all these people that want to move there, just recognize that and make a set of decisions.